Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for coming to the session. Uh, we'll wait to see if my slides get queued up here and see if I can figure out this. Um, thank you so much. My name is Dr. Marion McNabb, um, and I'm the president of the Cannabis Center of Excellence. Um, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for joining, guys. Um, there we go. Let's see. Oh, okay, good. All right. All right, so thank you so much. So um, I'm here to present um, data from a healthcare provider medical cannabis knowledge attitudes and practice study. So I'm the president of the Cannabis Center of Excellence. We're a 501c3 nonprofit based out of Massachusetts um, that works to conduct cannabis research studies, um, education programs, um, and social justice work. So um, this study, um, actually, I'm very grateful to CanMed and Medicinal Genomics. This was a partnership together um, with CanMed. Uh, last year, we um, joined together forces to launch um, the healthcare provider medical cannabis study. Um, these are some of the study partners that have joined in over the year um, to in support of the study and also to help get the word out about it. So thank you to all of our partners and to CanMed and to Medicinal Genomics. So um, I am a public health doctor by training, and I have been studying cannabis for five years now, based out of Massachusetts, and I've conducted uh, six different research studies now. The first uh, couple of research studies, this is data that is presented um, from studies from consumers and patients that I've led over the last couple of years. And what this shows, we asked in those studies previously, where do you as a cannabis consumer or patient find your information about medical cannabis? And on this slide, you can see a uh, majority of uh, those consumers and patients actually access their information from a mobile website or healthcare, uh, a mobile website or um, and a mobile application. Um, and way far at the end, you can see least likely reported um, are accessing information from their clinician or healthcare provider. So from the last couple of years, asking cannabis consumers and patients, you know, um, you're consuming cannabis for, for what health condition, et cetera, um, but they're not accessing their information from a healthcare provider, pointing to the importance of uh, this study that we conducted. So the Healthcare Provider Medical Cannabis Study was launched in May of last year, and I'm here today to present the preliminary findings. Um, there are 354 healthcare providers that took the survey. Um, the study actually will end in August of this year and was approved by the University of Massachusetts um, Dartmouth Institutional Review Board. Again, the study is led by the COE, um, Medicinal Genomics, and UMass Dartmouth. So throughout um, the last year, we had several co-investigators that have joined this study uh, that either contributed to the design and the development of the study tools and the instruments, um, or have really worked to help um, do outreach um, for the study and raise awareness to get healthcare providers uh, to take the study. So thank you to all the co-investigators, some of who are here presenting also at CanMed. And again, thank you to the study partners for helping to make this study possible. So um, what this is, is an anonymous survey asking healthcare providers what they know, what they want to know, and how they want to learn it about cannabis. And what we did over the last year was think about some pretty innovative ways to collect data. And why do we do this? Um, because we're in the middle of a COVID, we were in, in the middle of a COVID pandemic. Our healthcare providers are struggling. They themselves have PTSD um, and high levels of anxiety, um, and we're asking them to take a survey and 10 minutes out of their time to uh, contribute to knowledge. Um, so already, you know, we're working with a population that is, um, you know, stressed. And so we wanted to work on, as a public health professional by training, I also um, think about ways to not only conduct research studies, but also how do you drive policy and education around um, the data that you collect. And so we've implemented several different innovative um, data collection methodologies and outreach uh, for this particular study. So we've had flyers, QR codes, social media blasts, email blasts to healthcare providers and systems. 
um, attended a number of community events. I'm based in Massachusetts, um, so raising awareness um, at local community and asking uh, citizens to go talk to their healthcare providers about it, um, and presented um, this study in several different ways over the last year to raise awareness and uh, increase our sample size. And one of the things that we've launched in the last um, year is something called the Cannabis Citizen Scientist, which um, is a program that we launched to inspire um, citizens and patients themselves to be outreach um, data collectors, so to speak, um, and raise awareness about um, cannabis and about um, healthcare and their healthcare communities. So of those events that I talked about um, in the last year um, have generated about 30 or so citizen scientists um, in Massachusetts that have been helping us to raise awareness and get the word out about medical cannabis, about the Center of Excellence, and about this study. Um, this is our, our uh, one uh, sort of key citizen scientist who's done a lot of work in calling hospitals and health centers um, around Massachusetts to try and um, raise awareness. We also formulated a partnership with a cannabis transport company um, that works with 90% of the cannabis uh, dispensaries and operations in Massachusetts to uh, help us take study packets out uh, to different outlets and asking different cannabis outlets to then reach out to their local um, hospitals, health centers, and communities uh, to raise awareness about the study and kind of start to drive conversation. So this partnership just launched uh, this year, and um, they we've given 110 study packets uh, to them uh, last month, and um, they're in the process of distributing all of these. They're in the middle of it, and so far have reached almost every corner of Massachusetts, getting the word out. Um, so this is really exciting. It's a kind of a new, innovative way we, we thought to um, get the word out, and so they've delivered these study packets and requested every single uh, cannabis partner that they have um, to, um, you know, share uh, with their local healthcare providers and their local healthcare systems. So by the end of the study in August, hopefully we'll have some more information about the, you know, how it worked, um, you know, whether or not it did raise awareness or, or increase our sample size um, and drive conversation in these local communities. So diving right in uh, from a year's worth of data um, that we've collected so far, uh, we've had 354 respondents to the survey um, to date. The um, most common profession that has responded is actually nurses at 25%. Go nurses, and I'm giving a thank you to, uh, there's a lot of nurses that I know here in the audience that are also participating and helping, so thank you. Um, you know, I think nurses are a very important uh, part of our healthcare system, particularly when um, dealing with cannabis patients, because they're in day to day. Um, we have had the most of our respondents from California, interestingly. Um, second, uh, followed by Massachusetts, and I think with our targeted outreach in Massachusetts over the next few months, um, we might raise our numbers there. Um, the majority of the respondents so far are women, and we have um, about 78% um, white, followed by 10% African American um, in our sample size so far. 17% uh, of the healthcare respondents actually work for the Veterans Affairs. About 50% are below the age of 40 years, and over about 50% have an income less of $100,000. Um, among the healthcare providers themselves, 13% report that they are veterans, and 66% uh, are employed full time. Um, when we ask them type of, of healthcare facility, um, it's mainly the most common is a private practice followed by a government hospital, and about uh, it looks like about less than 40% um, of our sample has been a healthcare provider for six years or less. So these are fairly young providers, um, new in their profession, um, but exciting that uh, we have such a large amount that's working at the, the VA. Now, um, we asked, and I, I interestingly, and I've always asked this question, whether or not the healthcare provider themselves actually consumes cannabis, and this was surprising to me. 42% of the people, healthcare providers in our SAML, reported that they themselves are cannabis consumers or patients. Now, that's a really important and interesting data point to note as we move forward in some of the data presented, because this is a population of cannabis consumers and patients that find benefit themselves, in addition to being healthcare providers. 
84% of the sample I've actually um, visited a dispensary, which is very good. I know a lot of healthcare providers that haven't ever even visited one. Um, and um, out of those that report experience with cannabis, they've had a positive, most have had a positive or extremely positive experience. So just in sum, we have majority uh, women, a um, uh, high population of nurses. Um, we have a younger population that's reporting. Um, they're currently cannabis consumers and you know, have visited a dispensary. So pretty knowledgeable uh, respondents. So um, we asked also, are you licensed to actually recommend medical cannabis in your state? 54% said they are licensed, and out of those that were not licensed to recommend cannabis in their state, about half of them said that they intended to become licensed in the future. And when we asked, you know, what are some barriers for you to actually accessing licensure, um, some of them that reported, um, you know, one, they didn't want to be certified. Uh, state body doesn't recognize their profession to be certified. And so I think that's an important one to note. Um, state by state barriers for, you know, somebody who actually wants to become a recommender. Um, and then there's other issues such as, um, you know, my healthcare facility or organization prevents me from becoming a recommender of cannabis uh, or don't ask, don't tell policy at their workplace. Um, now, when we asked all the healthcare providers, do you believe medical cannabis has a role in medical care? And 37% believed it has a role as a first line medical treatment. That's pretty, yeah, I mean, that's a pretty significant um, data point. And then right of following that, 30% believe that there's some role for specific health conditions. And then 13% believe that there's a role if the first line treatments fail, there's a role for medical cannabis. And then 12% said they just needed more scientific evidence to actually make a decision about this. Out of the sample, um, you know, the we asked, have you received formal education training? 60% had received some formal training. And out of those, um, did they get CME credits? About 75% actually got CME credits. And 62% reported that their workplace had a policy related to medical cannabis. Now, this is um, actually one of probably my favorite graph as I've looked at this data quite a bit. <laughs> um, but it's interesting because it shows that um, you know, the majority of respondents really believe that medical cannabis is effective, just said that you know, about the first line treatment. The majority also somewhat agree or agree that medical cannabis can be a beneficial tool in the opioid epidemic. And by and large, they largely uh, disagreed that cannabis is a gateway to other illicit drugs. So we're starting to see potentially, at least in this population, that shift away from um, the cannabis is a gateway drug. Um, there's still some uncertainty around um, you know, whether or not, uh, from healthcare providers, whether or not in inhaled cannabis has the same risk as tobacco um, or other uh, combustible products. And that was a really interesting presentation about the vapes earlier. And I think um, having more training around vapes and combustion uh, for healthcare providers and for patients is actually really important. Um, these graphs, all like the top two, um, really uh, showing that, um, again, the healthcare providers in these samples really strongly agree or agree that medical cannabis is a legitimate um, medical therapy, and that they also agree that healthcare providers should be offering medical cannabis to manage um, conditions. Um, they, you know, again, somewhat found the process um, to certify patients within programs is somewhat difficult to navigate. And then, you know, believe that, um, you know, a little, it looks like a little less than half uh, strongly agree or agree, believe that the process to certify patients in the program actually prevents them from enrolling patients. So these are just regular, you know, regulatory barriers to access or just challenges just for even becoming uh, part of the program. Um, majority of the, the respondents in the sample um, regularly ask their patients about medical cannabis use and report that their patients feel comfortable talking to them about their cannabis use. But the providers are, you know, not strongly agreeing that their patient is very knowledgeable about cannabis. 
Um, so these, uh, this group feels like uh, maybe more potential patient education is warranted. We asked um, the providers how helpful do they think uh, cannabinoids are in the treatment of a variety of conditions. And there was a top few winners among, this is not an exhaustive list of um, conditions, um, but cancer pain by and far, providers thought would be very helpful or somewhat helpful medical cannabis for. Um, then you can see seizures as well, but less so on glaucoma, Tourette's and, and others. Uh, chronic and intractable pain, providers thought that um, the cannabis would be very helpful or somewhat helpful for. Um, and in addition, terminal illness and uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. Interestingly, um, post-traumatic stress disorder, you know, is a complex um, uh, condition. Um, and I have looked in this in the a veterans population specifically in the past, and I think there's a lot of uh, interesting nuances related to PTSD. Um, so interested to hear that this uh, cohort also thought that uh, cannabis could be very helpful or somewhat helpful for that category. When looking at um, these other types of uh, health conditions, um, ALS and Parkinson's coming out as uh, top contenders, so to speak, um, and Alzheimer's as well. Um, but you can see, you know, uh, in all of these conditions um, that we've just seen these graphs, you know, more than 50% of the sample believes that medical cannabis has some role to play, either very helpful or somewhat helpful. So, um, you know, looking at across a myriad of health conditions, a myriad of symptoms, and these providers are seeing relief in this, just underlines the point of, you know, the endocannabinoid system, deficiencies, and personalized medicine, and really paying attention to the patient themselves. Um, is important for cannabis medicine. Uh, so there's both uh, mental um, health relief and physical symptom relief um, that you know patients and consumers in the studies that I've run and others have run find um, you know cannabis is helpful for. Um, so in this sample, not only um, you know do clinicians think it will help improve physical functioning and energy level. Um, mood, enjoyment of life, social engagement, ability to work, which I think is a big one um, when you want to, you know, improve quality of life um, and return to work, and also the sense of hope. Um, again, just in summary, you know, about over half of our sample has received some formal training about medical cannabis. Um, about half are registered to recommend medical cannabis by a state. 37% believe medical cannabis can be a first-line treatment, um, and 70% agree that cannabis can be used, strongly agree or agree that cannabis can be used to address the opioid epidemic. These were the top conditions that um, you know, uh, just presented around what came out to be the most uh, strongly agree or agree uh, related to the medical value of cannabis. But again, cannabis is not a one-size-fits-all. Um, it's not for everybody. It's, um, you know, uh, and there are some, obviously, concerns uh, that we should be aware of. And um, <clears throat> in this sample, specifically, respondents um, were asked, what do they think about the risk of using cannabis? Does it increase the risk of possible psychotic symptoms, depression, memory problems, respiratory, and motor vehicle accidents? And by far, psychotic, or psychotic uh, symptoms and motor vehicle accidents are among the top concerns uh, among the sample. We also asked, you know, would this have any, um, po would cannabis use increase the possible risk of low birth weight, drug overdose, stroke, stroke diabetes, heart attack, and cancer? Um, and you can see um, those results here as well. I think one of the major um, one concerns of regulators, of families, of parents also is the potential for youth to have access or uh, the potential for recreational misuse. Um, so here, when we ask these healthcare providers, the um, you know it looks by and large that m potential for recreational misuse of medical cannabis is is not of a big concern, um, nor is the um, possibility of diversion, which is quite interesting because when you hear a lot of um, critics, you know, these are the two, two of the main um, areas that people tend to think about possible risk. But 
Um, what is concerning to these healthcare providers is lack of FDA approval and driving under the influence of cannabis, which are two very valid um, concerns. And also asked about, you know, sort of um, the use, other, other concerns about using medical cannabis for those who have a history of alcohol or drug dependence. Um, they're less likely concerned of that, but more concerned about their patients being able to find and afford a, re a re regular medical cannabis supply. Um, providers were also um, worried about potential of losing their medical license or legal repercussions for becoming um, a medical cannabis recommender. Uh, stigma related to supporting cannabis as a medicine, um, and then again, a youth access uh, causing health risks. So turning into um, you know, specific data points around knowledge around medical cannabis, this is gonna be a lot of, of data points thrown at you very quickly, and I, I know I'm also running out of time, so I'll try and do it as much justice as possible. Um, we asked, okay, what, what do you know, um, how do you wanna learn about medical cannabis in the future? And this healthcare provider sample prefers to learn um, but via lecture and scientific journals and peer-reviewed publications as their top ways, um, then followed by news or a national curriculum or uh, industry training. Well, we asked their level of confidence in certain key competencies um, related to either knowledge or practice. So um, the uh, yellow and the orange, obviously being confident and f or completely confident and fairly confident. So this population felt, you know, pretty confident about knowing how to evaluate for drug cannabis interactions, um, also how to retrieve drug information for the use of medical cannabis. Um, also were um, by and large more comfortable knowing how to talk to a patient who uses cannabis about the medical benefits um, and knowing how to talk about the dosage forms that are available for cannabis. But less so knowledgeable about um, the effects of receptor activation on neuro, neuro function or the physiology of the endocannabinoid system and really um, less knowledgeable on the pharmacology and the receptors that they act upon, um, but more and, and less so obviously on mechanisms of, of action for different cannabinoids um, and phytocannabinoids. Here, um, we asked about um, a variety of physiology, um, at, like I said, activation on uh, neurons. Um, you know, are they familiar with the pharmacology of cannabinoids and the receptors that they act upon? Um, and all of these um, felt, you know, right around the range of 50% uh, being, yes, I know, and, and no, really, I, I, I somewhat know and, and need more information. When asked about um, cannabis-derived products and how they're metabolized, issues around labeling and accuracy of labeling, um, the stability of active ingredients in hemp and artisanal products, how hemp and non-FDA um, cannabis products are produced. You can see all of these are hovering really around half of this population feels very confident or very knowledgeable about it and, and half not. Um, and less so on the likelihood of, um, you know, important things like um, transmission of cannabis-derived products through breast milk, which actually a colleague presented recently on in, at Canex. When asked um, about differences between, um, you know, FDA-approved um, products and products that are out on the market, um, less knowledgeable, um, really less knowledgeable also about, um, you know, understanding the potential role of terpenes in enhancing these products, um, or again, the uses of FDA-purified uh, CBD products. So some key takeaways, um, again, over half of our sample, we have a very knowledgeable sample, I feel like, about medical cannabis um, and about key competencies about it. Um, half of the group and the majority of these um, uh, data points around knowledge felt uh, very knowledgeable um, or somewhat knowledgeable, uh, but they were less likely to know the mechanisms of action and um, really unsure of, you know, really trying to drill down between FDA-approved and non-FDA-approved products. 
But to close out, we asked um, whether or not, you know, what should be sort of the next steps around medical education and some of these competencies. And um, over 50%, and these are over 60% of our sample, they still agree, although they felt like they were very knowledgeable, that they need more education about medical cannabis, more education about the endocannabinoid system, more information about where to find um, data in the scientific literature, where to get um, actual legitimate CME courses. So thank you to um, you know, CanMed for putting on this conference. We need more like this. Um, and, you know, 60% um, said that of the healthcare providers prefer to learn actually through a CME course online, but they also were interested in lear learning about medical cannabis in person through in-person events. Really, everybody's interested in learning cannabis, a majority over half are interested in learning cannabis, medical cannabis, and its impacts on a variety of conditions from cancer, pediatrics, PTSD, chronic pain, um, even now with COVID, or uh, seniors 55 plus. So I think there's room for um, all different types of specialties, all different types of healthcare providers, um, you know, different health conditions where this can be studied and continue to be implemented in the, in the future in different care and treatment paradigms. And um, by and large, majority agree that medical cannabis education should be a part of the required curriculum in the next five years. Um, that you know, there should be more education on how to discuss and counsel the risks and benefits of cannabis use to be included in, in healthcare provider curriculum. Um, education around the pharmacology of cannabinoids and cannabis use. Um, so I think there's a real opportunity to you know, create uh, teams of healthcare providers, the nurses, physicians, uh, pharmacists, you know, from a variety of areas um, to maybe do clinical case rounds and studies and have discussions and bring in different areas of, um, you know, education for um, one within, within a curriculum, but also within a, a healthcare center community. And 72% uh, believe that students um, should receive education not only about medical cannabis, but about their state program laws and about their medical cannabis program, which I think is really critical to know what they can do, what they can't do. Um, so not only, you know, what are, what are the science and clinical aspects, but what's the state and regulations around it. So I'd like to thank the study partners. I'd like to thank the study co-investigators um, and everybody who's been a part of this study to date and has either taken the study. I know some people in the audience have filled out the survey and some people in the audience have helped us distribute the survey as a, a co-investigator. So thank you to everybody and thank you to um, the companies that are, are listed here that are, uh, have been participating on this study. For the next steps, um, as I mentioned, we, we do have this partnership. We're raising awareness uh, locally in Massachusetts um, through um, a partnership with Eagle Eyes Transport. And we'll be continuing to get the word out um, and data will be collected until August 1st. Um, then we will prepare a final report and publication and make this data available um, so that the community can continue to learn and develop education programs that um, might you know, uh, be able to utilize some of this information to help help drive the field forward. So thank you very much. Um, I know I'm a little over time, so appreciate the time. Yeah, I think I'll take one question and then, yes, please. <laughs> From an amazing woman, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Hello. Okay. I have uh, six comments, two questions, and a suggestion. Awesome. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, thank you so much. There's so much in this that I want to dive into. I'm curious, did you break down the healthcare professionals that were using, admitted to using cannabis, whether or not um, they worked at the VA? Um, because, you know, so many of us have to go through drug testing to be yeah. able to be employed at these places that I'm curious about, you know, how many of us are closet, you know, cannabis? users, right, because of our profession. Is, was there any data points in there? I haven't dug into that, but I will dig into that. Let's talk. And that'll be part of the final publication. And um, is there an opportunity to get this out to people here in the room who haven't taken it yet? It's 
differently. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, yeah, and I know if um, CanMed, I've been talking with Ben, who's organizing, we can try and get the survey out to everybody that has come to CanMed to see if they'd be interested to, yeah, we'd love that. I've heard, um, you know, that a lot of people that have come to CanMed this year, this might actually be their first time learning about cannabis. So, um, yeah, if anybody would be willing to do, if you're a healthcare provider in the audience and you want to take the study, thank you. Please do. We're collecting data until August, and we will um, prepare uh, a publication about it. I have a question. Yes. <laughs> um, can other folks outside of Massachusetts help with the citizen science aspect? Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. Yes, please reach out. Um, yeah, any anybody. We did it as a pilot test in Massachusetts um, just to see, you know, would people like this? Would they pick up on it? And it has been very interesting because I think when you, I was saying earlier, when you're a cannabis patient and the cannabis patients that I've interacted with and they find that it really helps, they become some of the biggest champions and advocates. And so, um, you know, this woman who literally got off of all these opioids and, you know, can walk again, she's the biggest advocate calling every hospital and health center around, you know, kind of raising awareness, so for sure. Um, just reach out on cannacenterofexcellence.org and um, we could sign up there. Yeah, awesome. Well, thank you all so much, I appreciate it.